Good morning, all. Hi, Robin. So good to hear about your daughter and she's doing well. We've been praying for her. And Nancy Horvath, good morning. Hi, Norma Bentley. It is God's morning. And Kevin Vaughn and Chris Vaughn, good morning. Hi, Linda Wolf. Janet Lyons, good morning. Barry and Margo, good morning to you. And Joan Riggs, good morning. Hi, Judy Hatch. Hi, Ken Woods, Sandy Sauerbeck, Tammy Jones, hello. Larry and Carolyn Thomas, good morning. Hi, Judy Sutherland, and Jean Hardwig is with us today. Judy Martin is also. So good to see you all. I hope you had a um, good weekend. We are Joy, Joy and Steve Yambor are with us, too. It is a... Um, Hi, Mary. My Aunt Mary, she's asking, asking about Tom. I'll handle that. He's fine. They got, um, they were, uh, they never lost power, but they did lose water, but that gone by Friday or Saturday. So uh, he, Tom, my son Tom is down in Houston. Of course, they had terrible, terrible problems down there. So um, the, um, the only thing that I, only help I could tell him is that, um, they were having problems flushing toilets because of the water. So um, he wanted to know how much water he needed to put in the toilet to flush it. And uh, so that led to uh, <laughs> that led to some fun uh, things. I said, well, if you take the top of it off, there should be, uh, if there's not a line etched into it, there should certainly be a scum line for the water. I said, fill it up to that. And then we found out that, you know, you don't even need to fill that up if you just pour buckets of water into your toilet. It will flush itself. They were able to get water from the pool. So, but, uh, so they're doing well. They're doing well. That was the, that was uh, what was going on down there. Let me see who else is here. So, hi, Paul Wolf. Good morning. Hi, Tracy Crutz. Good morning. It is slushy, slushy, slushy around here. Um, we got, I guess, a between an inch and two of snow, but it started to mix with rain early this morning and uh, the temperature's going up. I kind of scraped everything off of our driveway before I came into work today. Hi, Sherry Keys. Mose and Marsha Nolan, good morning. Well, thank you, Janet. I'm glad that uh, it was valuable to people, the sermon yesterday. But, uh, it's easy to preach when you got good subject matter, you know? Suma Causland, good morning. Scott Johnson, good morning. Hi, Joanne Butters. Hi, Kip. And hi, we've got we've got Carrie with us. Good morning, and hi, Amy Bowerman. So it was a great worship. It really was. Um, we went a little bit long, but that's okay sometimes, right? I don't just I won't make a practice of it. Um, but um, had a lot of people. A lot of people there and a lot of people commenting afterwards that they thought it was a great worship service. So we do invite all into that. As far as news goes today, um, we have uh, tomorrow night at 7, we're going to have that practice Zoom call because we were having our uh, annual meeting on the 28th of February. And uh, the... Um, uh, so that is that will be done via, via Zoom. So we want everybody to have the, that feels a little uncomfortable with Zoom to have that opportunity to practice. So we will have that, uh, have that practice um, on Tuesday at 7 p.m. for anybody that might want it, wants to do it. And it's also, we're figuring out things too. So a little bit of grace is always good. Um, and then Wednesday at 7 p.m. we're gonna be doing that Zoom-based Bible study on the Lenten, uh, during Lent, our Lenten study. And we'll be looking at um, we'll be looking at Lent. What is it? How long has the church uh, been? I don't want to say celebrating, but observing Lent, and what were the purposes of it? So that'll be uh, that'll be some fun times. And then, if we uh, can, if we have time, we'll move into some of the um, expectations of Lent that we see uh, within the Bible, uh, especially in the Book of Isaiah. But uh, if we do get into that, we're just going to touch on it a little bit, just to familiarize folks. The um, the uh, 
the, uh, the all of these things are available. If you haven't received the emails about the links, uh, best way to get a hold of Carrie. She can send those to you. Nancy Sparks, good morning. And uh, so that's on Wednesday. Of course, Thursday we'll have our grief share, which meets via Zoom. And uh, thank God for Zoom, right? Although there's other ones out there. There's Skype and then there's Microsoft Teams. Doug Goddard, good morning. Hi, Ann Winslow. Oh, she's a, you're a great grandmother, a little girl. Hey, wonderful. Celebration. Congratulations, Ann. So that's, so if, if you were looking for something, there's something to do Tuesday and Wednesday for sure. And uh, uh, we'll do that. And then, uh, but other than that, we're moving along. Um, there should be uh, um, those, uh, the annual report will be available this week. So that will be available in PDF that we can be sent by email to anybody who wants it. Um, and then also, uh, if you need it printed out, let us know that. We'll print it out and make it available for you to pick up here at the church. So, all right. That's what we're doing. It's a busy, busy day. Oh, my gosh. We have a new record. We have 38 devices that are watching. I don't know if I've ever seen it that high before. Oh. All right. And uh, so, we will move along here to our devotions today, right? That's what everybody comes for, to say good morning to everybody. And, um, but this is on Monday, February 22nd. And we are in Lent, we are in Lent. So uh, here's a, here's a, our, our opening Psalm is a little different. You know, a lot of times we kind of repeat on Psalms, um, but this one is, um, I'm sure we've done it before, but not, not recently. This is Psalm 119, and it's verses 73 through 80. So let me take a sip of my coffee before we get going. All right. Let's listen for the word of the Lord for us today. Your hands have made and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. Those who fear you shall see me and rejoice, because I have hoped in your word. I know, O Lord, that your judgments are right, and that in faithfulness you have humbled me. Let your steadfast love become my comfort, according to your promise to your servant. Let your mercy come to me, that I may live, for your law is my delight. Let the arrogant be put to shame, because they have subverted me with guile. As for me, I will meditate on your precepts. Let those who fear you turn to me, so that they may know your decrees. May my heart be blameless in your statutes, so that I may not be put to shame. So ends this reading of the word of the Lord. I've always called this uh, the pastor psalm, um, that uh, when you're a minister, uh, this is a good one to read occasionally. Because I'm not going to say that ministering is any more difficult than any other job. Every job comes with difficulties, but um, sometimes uh, ministers are, you know, you're trying to, you're trying your best to be holy and you're trying to make yourself available to people. And, you know, when you're trying to meet everybody's expectations, it gets really tough sometimes. So a lot of ministers, pastors, um, and let's face it, um, you know, you tend to get people that, um, that um, feel other people's pain that, that are drawn into it as a career. So um, you can start to feel pretty wounded yourself sometimes. And uh, so it's in times like that where if you don't, if you don't have something like this to fall back on so that you rely on God, you can start to just to try to do things on your own. And I use this because this is, this had been given to me uh, when I was in seminary and they said, hey, this is a great thing to read when you're feeling down. I think it's a good thing for everybody because what happens is when things start to go wrong, um, it colors our whole world. And um, the um, and so then we start to not be able to see any good or we start to suspect everything and everybody. We start to see conspiracies um, or we develop conspiracy theories on our own. 
that are really not logical and, uh, and not true either. So this is one uh, that uh, we're not sure where it's a later psalm. So uh, they think, you know, some people say that David wrote it. I, I don't know about that. I think it's a little bit later. And I think it's somebody that was probably in the priesthood because it talks about, uh, you know, send people to me <laughs> that have seen your light. That makes his job easier, right? <laughs> All right. And we're going to, we're in Deuteronomy, and we're in the eighth chapter, verses one through 20. So um, this is, again, Deuteronomy is this big, uh, I'm not even going to call it encapsulation because it goes through everything uh, that Moses is telling the nation of Israel before they're, they cross over into the promised land, things that are most important, reminding them of uh, how gracious and loving God has been to them, even in the midst of all the difficulties that they face. So here we go, uh, chapter 8, verses 1 through 20 of Deuteronomy. This entire commandment that I command you today, you must diligently observe, so that you may live and increase and go in and occupy the land that the Lord promised an oath to your ancestors. Remember the long way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, in order to humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commandments. He humbled you by letting you hunger, then by feeding you with manna, with which neither you, you nor your ancestors were acquainted, in order to make you understand that no one, I'm sorry, you understand that one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. The clothes on your back did not wear out, and your feet did not swell these forty years. Know then in your heart that as a parent disciplines a child, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Therefore, keep the commandments of the Lord your God, by walking in his ways and by fearing him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with flowing streams, with springs and underground waters welling up in valleys and hills a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey, a land where you may eat bread without scarcity, where you lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron and from whose hills you may mine copper. You shall eat your fill and bless the Lord your God for the good land that he has given you. Take care that you do not forget the Lord your God by failing to keep his commandments, his ordinances, and his statutes, which I am commanding you today. When you have eaten your fill, and have built fine houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks have multiplied, and your silver and gold is multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, then do not exalt yourself, forgetting the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrible wilderness, an arid wasteland with poisonous snakes and scorpions. He made water flow for you from flint rock and fed you in the wilderness with manna that your ancestors did not know to humble you and to test you and in the end to do you good. Do not say to yourself, my power and the might of my own hand have gotten me this wealth. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth so that he may confer, uh, confirm his covenant that he swore to your ancestors as he is doing today. If you do forget the Lord your God and follow other gods to serve and worship them, I solemnly warn you today that you shall surely perish. Like the nations that the Lord is destroying before you, so shall you perish, because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God. So ends this reading of the word of the Lord. All thanks be to God. I think that this uh, does a great job of um, kind of launching us into um, one of the purposes of Lent. Um, you know, it's it's this discipline, um, and we get the discipline in scarcity uh, because we strip things away. So we find out that we can't be just dependent upon ourselves to provide everything. And uh, here it is. Here's God uh, through Moses telling the people. Remember this, you are about to accomplish a great thing. 
and I have prepared you for it, and I have given you. Um, and so as you um, now remember when they were crossing over and over the Jordan into Canaan, that there was already other tribes who had their own religions that were there. So uh, space had to be made uh, for the nation of Israel. And we know that um, that was not, uh, that wasn't just people saying, oh, welcome here, have this land. There was, there was battles uh, to get that land. But we also know that um, it, there was an off, because of archeolo archeological digs, that uh, there's no evidence that there was like this massive military movement that it was, um, it, it happened uh, over time. Synchronous is, is what they call it. So, so it's syncretic. And it, so they, they gradually moved out. And part of it was the melding of people that were there with the nation of Israel. Now remember, there was other religions. And so that was the danger that's being warned about here, right? Don't, as, as the blessing comes to fruition, as you see increased yields in your crops and in your herds, and in your your own wealth, uh, remember that it's God that gave that to you, and uh, and don't don't rely, right? And most of all, don't forget the Lord your God and follow other gods to serve and worship them, because the threat, every blessing that uh, God provides in the Bible, there's also a curse, and the curse on this one is that He says you will, you shall surely perish. Um, interesting thing. Here is this is where when Jesus is in the wilderness after his baptism, um, Satan comes and tempts him three times. And one of the times that he tempts him is he says, "Worship me, right? And um, you, I will I will provide bread for the world." So in other words, sell out to me, and I'll and I'll let you take care of people. And Jesus responds, "One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord." This is where it comes from. So he's quoting scripture at the at, at the devil. Okay, our our reading in the New Testament, our first reading in the New Testament is Hebrews, letter to the Hebrews, chapter two, verses eleven through eighteen. And uh, this is um, this is a letter that's being written to a new Christian church who is substantially made up of Jewish people. So it has a very Jewish emphasis and, um, you know, uh, pulls on, on Jewish tradition. But um, the purpose of it is to really strip these people away from the elements of Judaism that are holding them back from fully understanding uh, that, that God was in Christ, right? That he wasn't just a prophet. Okay. So here we go. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here I am in the children whom God has given me. Since, therefore, the children share flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared the same things, so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. For it is clear that he did not come to help angels, but the descendants of Abraham. Therefore he had to become like his brothers and sisters in every respect, so that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself was tested by what he suffered, he is able to help those who are being tested. So ends this reading, the word of the Lord. Um, this is one. Of, this section is one of the reasons why uh, we find this hard to actually attribute it to Paul, because. He's bringing up uh, a matter of theology, right? Theology is how we think or talk about God, how we understand God. And um, that there's no evidence that in the days of the apostles that their their thought process had gotten to this point, but it had later. And really what the question is, is the divinity of, God, of uh, Jesus. Is Was Jesus divine 
right? So we heard earlier in this that we read last week, we read about the fact that Jesus was above the angels, right? So he was he was a and and so but now they're making this thing saying we talked about the divinity of Christ, but now we got to talk about the humanity of Christ because we say that Christ is fully human and fully divine. Uh, why does he need to be fully human? Um, and, and this is one of those elements right here, because uh, according to the Jewish faith, um, the atonement had to be made for them and only another human would suffice. So therefore, the theology says that God, therefore, can't be just, uh, that Jesus can't be just divine, but he's also got to be fully human. So, I don't know, that's a little deep for a Monday morning, isn't it? Okay, our last reading, we're in John, Gospel of John, and we're moving on to the second, second uh, um, chapter, verses 1 through 12, and you'll, you'll know this one, this is famous section, the wedding in Cana. Let's listen for the word of the Lord. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stones of water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water. And they were filled up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that, that had become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs at Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother, his brothers, and his disciples, and they remain there for a few days. So ends this reading of the word of the Lord. All thanks be to God. So um, John's gospel differs from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We call Matthew, Mark, and Luke because they're very similar in form and share many of the same parables, many of the same stories. Some of it's a little bit, you know, the difference is it's like pearls on a string. Right, the pearls have been threaded in different ways in those three gospels, but we say that really it's got the same eye, so we call it sin optic, same eye, right? And uh, and then we have the Gospel of John, which is uh, uh, significantly different in form and even some of the things that are in it. This only appears in the Gospel of John. It occurs early in the Gospel of John, and um, and. Uh, it's the first miracle attributed to Jesus. So they're at, they're at a wedding, right? Somebody's getting married that they all knew. Now he's obviously been baptized because he has his disciples with him and he didn't start to gather them until after that. So his ministry has started. He has been baptized with the Holy Spirit. So he has the capability of doing these miracles. And his mom knows, right? <laughs> so the wine gave out. They were at the, they were at the wedding and uh, everybody was having such a good time that there was no more wine. And she said, hey, I know what you can do. Make some more wine. Let this party keep going. And uh, so he responds to her, what, hey, what concern is it to you and me, right? This isn't what I, I'm intended to do. My hour hasn't come yet. And she just says, just do it. <laughs> so he does. He makes he makes uh, six times 30, so 180 gallons of wine, and it's the finest wine. When the, when the, when the wine steward uh, is brought to him and he tastes it, he's like, oh my goodness, everybody serves, you know, the first round of bottles or the best wine, and then once everybody starts to uh, get a buzz on, I guess, right, uh, then, then they start bringing out the cheap stuff. And here, you've saved the best until the end. So a couple things about this. Um, first of all, the feeding of the 
4,000 and feeding of the 5,000 does not appear in the Gospel of John. So there is a strand of theological thought that this is John's uh, miracle of multiplication. But he also, uh, there, there's, there's a couple subtexts that are playing through this, right? And the first one is, if you remember, the wine uh, at the Last Supper, right, becomes the blood. So it says, um, you know, it, it, it's about the fact that the best wine, the wine that's going to provide salvation, is the blood of Christ. So there you go. Maybe you know, maybe you heard something you hadn't heard before. But that's it. Let me come back over to Facebook here and uh, see what we got. We need to have prayers for Mark Maui's son. Of course, we're going to pray for Jen, right? And uh, Mark, Mark Davis. Okay. So Mark's son. And... Um, Sherry, I knew Sherry would have a question. Good. Do you think Mary gave him the look when he called her a woman? <laughs> yes. Yes, I do. Right? This is, um, um, there's two There's two instances in the Bible where I think that we see the Jewishness. This is going to sound stereotypical, and I don't mean it to be that way. But um, the uh, there's two elements in the Bible which show us the Jewishness of, uh, of uh, the divine and the first one would be when um, uh, when Moses right comes across the burning bush. He's looking for that lost sheep, and he sees this uh, this glinting off in the distance. As he gets there, he sees it's this bush. Um, it's this bush that's uh, burning but not being consumed. And when he goes there, um, God tells him, "Hey, take off your shoes. You're on holy ground." And I just I always laugh. Because I had um, uh, my freshman roommate in college um, lived close to, I went to Brown in Providence, Rhode Island, and he lived very close to Providence. So we would go to his house at times, and um, and he and Jeff was Jewish, and his mom, and we always had to take our shoes off before we came in the house. He's like, hey, take those shoes off. Don't get this, don't get this place dirty. So. And then the second thing is this, you know, and I just think it was Jewish mother, you know, it's like, what? <laughs> what? You're, you're going to question me? Just do it. Just do it. So, yes, I do think Mary gave him the look. And I think that Jesus was a great son <laughs> because if you notice, he did it. <laughs> he did it without arguing. He just, oh, it's easier just to give her what she wants. We'll make this my first miracle. All right. That's fun. That's fun here. All right. So we, we are going to pray here. So we need to pray for Mark Davis's son. And we're going to pray, pray for Jen, who is uh, Robin's daughter. But she's doing better. Right, Robin? That's what we understand. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the scripture that you've given us to consume together. And we ask that uh, as we as we imbibe of it, uh, that it would be food for us, so that it would feed our journeys uh, with you during this course of Lent. That uh, the purposes, as we read it, that we will gain a deeper understanding of not only you, but your love for us. And Lord, as we gather here today, we know that there are people that are not doing well. We pray for people who are in need of physical healing. We pray for Mark Davis's son. And uh, we pray, pray for Robin Allen's daughter, Jen, that uh, they will be returned to full health. We also pray for those who are struggling with uh, relationships today. Um, and we also pray that, uh, that, that the people who are uh, suffering uh, because of the scarcity of supplies in areas of this country and the world, that they will uh, have those things that are needed, provided to them. And Lord, we just pray for gratefulness. We pray that uh, people will understand that there are people who care, that who can bring the light of Christ into the world, and that uh, there is a better way. 
Lord, we pray for the kingdom. We pray for the kingdom that it might manifest itself and break out in wonderful ways all around us. Lord, make this Lent special. Make it so that uh, we might uh, open our eyes on Easter morning and that we can really celebrate. That we'll make it more than just candy and lilies. That we'll make it a new day. A new start. A new relationship with you. Lord, we pray all of this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Oh, Barbara Shute is with us. Hi, Barbara. Can we say hello to you? I don't think. Let me go down here to the bottom. Tracy Crutz says, you thought everyone took their shoes off when they out. Yeah, more so now. I mean. So, okay, and Denise has a question, let me see it. So why do some churches exclude people visiting from receiving the communion unless they are members? Oh, good question. All right, well, Denise, um, there's a couple of answers to that. And, and uh, the first one is, of course, if you go to a Catholic church uh, and you're not Catholic and you haven't been baptized and you haven't been, and you haven't received confirmation um, you're not to take it um, so and that is because the Catholic Church considers it a sacrament the same as the Protestant Church does but their understanding of it is different different they view it that it actually transforms or transubstantiates is the word and becomes the body and the blood of Christ and I'm not going to deny that there's a mysterious miracle that occurs in that but um, for them, it is the delivery of grace by consuming the body and the blood. So they have a they have a an understanding of that that is uh, differs, right? Differs. So in the Protestant Church, and I, I can talk more about Presbyterian beliefs than anything else, is that um, we believe that there's a mystery in it, and it could very well be that, but we don't hold it in that regard of the fact that we say that it is not the consumption of the elements that delivers grace. By participating in it, we are showing an outward sign of an inward grace, and we are participating, therefore, in God's salvation of the world through Jesus Christ. So that's that's a big difference. Um, the um, uh, the second the second uh, thing that's important to recognize is that um, there are some churches that create a fence. That's when we say that that communion is fenced, right? And that people have to come and they can't cross over that. Technically, even in the Presbyterian Church, until just a few years ago, right, communion was only supposed to be given. It didn't have to be members, but they had to be baptized. So I can remember that there were times. Uh, in church where it would say either in the bulletin or there would be announcement made saying all are welcome to, to, to participate, all baptized people are welcome to participate in communion. However, um, in the PCUSA, that's changed. We now have open communion. We do not deny it to anybody. Um, that we figure that it's God's grace and that if people are drawn nearer to God in Christ. Oh, is that it? It's Patty Allen's daughter. I'm sorry, Robin. Very good. I got my Allens mixed up. So, uh, but coming back to this communion, uh, so we we do not exclude anybody from uh, communion. So now I do have a funny story, right? I do have a funny story, um, and that is this. When I was in Homer, I got to know the Catholic priest at the Concord Catholic Church, um, and um, uh, it was Father Dennis, and we we developed quite the friendship and he's retired now so uh, the first time i met him um, he actually came to the presbyterian church for a funeral that was going on uh, for the sister of of somebody who was a member there and um, so uh, we started talking afterwards and then we would go out for lunch and we had some really really deep theological conversations we couldn't understand the differences between uh, you know why why churches of Jesus Christ, regardless of the denomination, couldn't share, you know, communion. And um, so, uh, and, and I had the, I, I had the great fortune of being assigned 
or, or being asked to serve on a committee that looked uh, with um, the Presbyterian Church and the Catholic Church. And we looked at saying, how can we start to share communion and, and baptism? So it used to be that Catholic churches wouldn't recognize Protestant baptism. And we did work on that and got that settled. So the Catholic Church does recognize um, Presbyterian church baptisms. But we just couldn't get over that, that hump uh, with the differences between the communion. And it wasn't really a Presbyterian issue. It was more the Catholic issue than anything else. So anyway, so I, I told him that story. So then I found myself, I went to his church because for, um, for a funeral mass. And um, I know that if, you, if you're at a Catholic church um, and then you get into this, and mass time comes and you say, well, I got to sit, right? I'm not Catholic and I'm going to sit here. Well, that creates a problem, but you can go forward. And then what you do is as you get forward, you cross your arms. Right. And then the priest will offer a blessing to you. And um, the um, uh, so when I went forward, there was Father Dennis. And, uh, you know, he had he had the cup and he had the host. And so as I came forward, I looked at him and he looked at me and I crossed my arms and he shook his head and he gave it to me. So afterwards, I called him and I said, are you going to tell Rome about that? <laughs> he goes, no, we'll just keep it there. He says, but. He says, your argument convinced me. Who are we to who are we to withhold God's grace from anybody? So that's that. I do tell our folks, um, I do tell our folks who are going to a Catholic Mass, don't get worked up about it. Really, you know, uh, respect respect the fact that they are a church of Jesus Christ and they do wonderful things in the world. Um, that uh, um, that they just have a different understanding of it of, of the you know, of the uh, sacrament than, than we do, and, and just respect that. So, all right, there you go. And Robin Allen, I apologize. And I also apologize to Patty Allen, because I know I got that. All right, so that's my stories for the day. Boy, I, I'm going on too long today, but we have prayed. So God bless you all. I love you all, and uh, we will see you tomorrow here at 9 a.m. I have a blessed day, everyone. Bye-bye.